Hello everyone. You are listening to this audiobook on channel Voice of Purpose by NSS IIT Bombay. Chapter 1 Part 2 This repeated eulogy on the great social statesman affected Harold March as if somebody had defined Napoleon as a distinguished player of nap. But he had another half-formed impression struggling in this flood of unfamiliar things and he brought it to the surface before it could vanish. Jenkins he repeated surely you don't mean Jefferson Jenkins the social reformer i mean the man who's fighting for the new cottage estate scheme it would be as interesting to meet him as any cabinet minister in the world if you'll excuse my saying so yes hawks told him it would have to be cottages said fisher he said the breed of cattle had improved too often and people were beginning to laugh and of course you must hang a peerage onto something Though the poor chap hasn't got it yet. Hello, here's somebody else. They had started walking in the tracks of the car, leaving it behind them in the hollow, still humming horribly like a huge insect that had killed a man. The tracks took them to the corner of the road, one arm of which went on in the same line toward the distant gates of the park. It was clear that the car had been driven down the long straight road, and then, instead of turning with the road to the left, had gone straight on over to turf to its doom but it was not this discovery that had riveted fisher's eye but something when more solid at the angle of the white road a dark and solitary figure was standing almost as still as a finger post it was that of a big man in rough shooting clothes bareheaded and with tousled curly hair that gave him a rather wild look on a nearer approach this first more fantastic impression faded In a full light the figure took on more conventional colors as of an ordinary gentleman who happened to have come out without a hat and without very studiously brushing his hair but the massive stature remained and something deep and even cavernous about the setting of the eyes redeemed his animal good looks from the common place but marsh had no time to study the man more closely for much to his astonishment his guide merely observed hello jack and walked past him as if he had indeed been a signpost and without attempting to inform him of the catastrophe beyond the rocks it was relatively a small thing but it was only the first in a string of singular antics on which his new and eccentric friend was leading him the man they had passed looked after him in a rather suspicious fashion but fisher continued serenely on his way along the straight road that ran past the gates of the great estate That's John Burke the traveler he condescended to explain I expect you've heard of him shoots big game and all that sorry i couldn't stop to introduce you but i dare say you'll meet him later on I know his book of course said march with renewed interest that is certainly a fine piece of description about there being only conscious of the closeness of the elephant when the colossal head blocked out the moon yes young halkett writes jolly well I think what didn't he know Halkett wrote Burke's book for him Burke can't use anything except a gun and you can't write with that oh he's genuine enough in his way you know as brave as a lion or a good deal braver by all accounts you seem to know all about him observed march with a rather bewildered laugh and about a good many other people fisher's bald brow became abruptly corrugated and a curious expression came into his eyes i know too much he said that's what the matter with me that's what's the matter with all of us and the whole show we know too much too much about one another too much about ourselves that's why i'm really interested just now about one thing that i don't know and that is in quite the other why that poor fellow is dead they had walked along the straight road for nearly a mile conversing at intervals in this fashion and march had a singular sense of the whole world being turned inside out mr horn fisher did not especially abuse his friends and relatives in fashionable society of some of them he spoke with affection but they seemed to be an entirely new set of men and women who happened to have the same nerves as the men and women mentioned most often in the newspapers yet no fury of revolt could have seemed to him more utterly revolutionary than this cold familiarity 
It was like daylight on the other side of state scenery. They reached the great lodge gates of the park, and to March's surprise, passed them and continued along the interminable white straight road. But he was himself too early for his appointment with Sir Howard, and was not disinclined to see the end of his new friend's experiment, whatever it might be. They had long left the moorland behind them, and half the white road was grey in the great shadow of the torwood pine forest. Themselves, like grey bars, shuttered against the sunshine and within, amid that clear afternoon, manufacturing their own midnight. Soon, however, rifts began to appear in them like gleams of coloured windows. The trees thinned and fell away as the road went forward, showing the wild, irregular corpses in which, as Fisher said, the house party had been blazing away all day. And about 200 yards farther, on they came to the first turn of the road. At the corner stood a sort of decayed inn with a dingy sign of the grapes. The signboard was dark and indecipherable by now and hung black against the sky and grey moorland beyond, about as inviting as a gallows. Marsh remarked that it looked like a tavern for vinegar instead of wine. A good phrase, said Fisher, and so it would be if you were silly enough to drink wine in it, but the beer is very good and so is the brandy. Marsh followed him to the bar parlour with some wonder, and his dim sense of repugnance was not dismissed by the first sight of the innkeeper, who was very widely different from the genial innkeepers of romance. A bony man, very silent behind a black moustache, but with black, restless eyes. Taciturn as he was, the investigator succeeded at last in extracting a scrap of information from him. By dint of ordering beer, and talking to him persistently and minutely on the subject of motor cars. He evidently regarded the innkeeper as in some singular way an authority on motor cars, as being deep in the secrets of the mechanism, management and mismanagement of motor cars, holding the man all the time with a glittering eye like the ancient mariner. Out of all this mysterious conversation there did emerge at last a sort of admission that one particular motor car of a given description had stopped before the inn about an hour before, and that an elderly man had alighted, requiring some mechanical assistance. Asked if the visitor required any other assistant, the innkeeper said shortly that the old gentleman had filled his flask and taken a packet of sandwiches, and with these words, the somewhat inhospitable host had walked hastily out of the bar, and they heard him banging doors in the dark interior. Fisher's weary eye wandered around the dusty and dreary inn parlour and rested dreamily on a glass case containing a stuffed bird, with a gun hung on hooks above it that seemed to be its only ornament. Puggy was a humorist, he observed, at least in his own rather grim style, but it seems rather too grim for a joke for a man to buy a packet of sandwiches when he is just going to commit suicide. If you come to that, answered March. It isn't very usual for a man to buy a packet of sandwiches when he's just outside the door of a grand house he's going to stop at. No, no, repeated Fisher, almost mechanically, and then suddenly cocked his eye at his interlocutor with a much livelier expression. By Joe, that's an idea. You're perfectly right. And that suggests a very queer idea, doesn't it? There was a silence. And then March started with irrational nervousness as the door of the inn was flung open and another man walked rapidly to the counter. He had struck it with a coin and called out for brandy before he saw the other two guests who were sitting at a bare wooden table under the window. Then he turned about with a rather wild stare. March had yet another unexpected motion, for his guide hailed the man as Hogs and introduced him as Sir Howard Horn. He looked rather older than his boyish portraits in the illustrated papers. As is the way of politicians, his flat, fair hair was touched with grey, but his face was almost comically round, with a Roman nose, which, when combined with his quick, bright eyes, raised a vague reminiscence of a parrot. He had a cap rather at the back of his head and a gun under his arm. Harold March had imagined many things about his meeting with a great political reformer, 
but he had never pictured him with a gun under his arm, drinking brandy in a public house. So you're stopping at Jinx too, said Fisher. Everybody seems to be at the Jinx. Yes, replied the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Jolly good shooting. At least, all of it that isn't Jinx shooting. I never knew a chap with such good shooting that was such a bad shot. Mind you, he's a jolly good fellow in all that and don't say a word against him. But he never learned to hold a gun when he was packing pork or whatever he did. They say he shot the cockade of his own servant's hat. Just like him to have cockades, of course. He shot the weathercock of his own ridiculous guided summer house. It's the only cock he's ever killed, I should think. Are you coming up there now? Fisher said, rather vaguely, that he is following soon. Then he had picked something up, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer left the inn. March fancied he had been a quite little upset or impatient when he called for the brandy, but he had talked himself back into a satisfactory state as if the talk had not been quite what his literary visitor had expected. Fisher, a few minutes afterward, slowly led the way out of the tavern and stood in the middle of the road, looking down in the direction from which they had travelled. Then he walked back about 200 yards in that direction and stood still again. I should think this is about the place, he said. What place? asked his companion. The place where the poor fellow was killed said Fisher sadly. What do you mean? demanded March. Was smashed up the rocks a mile and a half from here. No, he wasn't, replied Fisher. He didn't fall on the rocks at all. Didn't you notice that he only fell on the slope of soft grass underneath? But I saw that he had a bullet in him already. Then after a pause, he added. He was alive at the end, but he was dead long before he came to the rocks. So he was shot as he drove his car down the strip of straight road, and I should think somewhere about here. After that, of course, the car went straight on with nobody to stop or turn it. It's really a very cunning dodge in its way, for the body would be found far away, and most people would say, as you do, that it was an accident to a motorist. The murderer must have been a clever boot. Thank you. So hope you guys had fun. Please like, share and subscribe to this channel for more interesting audiobooks.